The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who have dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they picked themselves up, and how they hope workplaces can change in the future. Are you sad? I'm sad. And sometimes I'm overwhelmed by a sadness so intense it can only be described as grief. Like many of us, I grieve now for our world, our people, and our planet. Grief is in the air. On HBR, David Kessler wrote powerfully that the world, all of us, were feeling different kinds of grief for what we're experiencing right now and what we fear in the future. The loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection, it's all hitting us and we're grieving. The grief that we imagine in the future is really anxiety, Kessler tells us. It's like your mind is just going to a future point and imagining the worst. It's called catastrophizing. Have you been there recently? I definitely have, like a million times a day. Perhaps nothing has been more symbolic of the loss of our formerly prosperous and delicious way of life than the cratering of the restaurant industry during coronavirus. Food and drink has always been a brutal business. Working hours, really tough margins, But it's a creative industry full of innovation, and it's glamorous, something a lot of us are attracted to. Today's guest, Jody Adams, is someone who's been so resilient in the face of grief, and we'll talk with her about what happened a few years ago. But I think of her now as a leader in the Boston restaurant scene. In fact, when I called her for our interview, she had been participating in a webinar with restaurant owners about what to ask for in terms of aid. She's involved with seven restaurants, and she's working and leading with this once vibrant community to process a whole new kind of grief. Grief can manifest in different people in different ways, but it's often a situation where you can feel alone, trapped in your own mind, unable to see a future. And when organizations are facing a loss, being a leader and leading through grief can be really challenging. So we'll talk to Jody Adams about that. She joined me to talk about what it was like letting go of the restaurant where she'd spent two decades of her life at the same time when she was losing her sister to cancer. You describe your path out of Brown as a little bit uncertain. And I think you said you wanted to be a nurse practitioner. You got married for the first time at 24 and you were working at a gourmet food store in Rhode Island. And then your life changed. And and you said in an interview, if you're really unhappy in your marriage or in your professional goals at 25, then you really should make the shift because it's going to be a long life of misery if you don't. I figured that much out. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So so what happened when you were 24 to 25 that helped you make the shift into the life that that you have now? Well, when I, um, first of all, I found the right place in that gourmet food store. I had been taking courses to become a nurse practitioner. I had been working in a nursing home. It all was fine. But once I got behind that counter and I was dealing with beautiful cheeses and homemade breads and things like that, I knew that I was in the right place. I felt like I was home. It just was so natural. And I had married somebody because I was terrified of going out into the world after getting a degree that didn't provide me with a really clear path. I got a degree in anthropology. I was not going to become an academic. And this man entered my life and was a grown up. And I thought, that'll keep me safe. The problem is I grew up. (laughs) 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 And fast. And realized that I was in the wrong profession, that I wanted to be involved in food. It was, I had 
been involved in food all my life. And suddenly it was like, oh my God, I can do this. It's, it's a real thing. It was when Dina DeLuca had just exploded in New York. Restaurants were becoming recognized and respected. Chefs' names were getting to be known. Julia Child was a force. And so I could see this world that I could be a part of that was really exciting and, and was mine. And the man I was married to really wasn't excited about this, this person who was kind of soaring. And we just, it was, it was not good. So I, I had spent some time trying to, we did try to fix the marriage. Ultimately though, there was a tape in my head that said, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. I'm so unhappy. And I realized that I was telling lies all through the day just to get through the day so as not to rock the boat. And that just wasn't me. In Boston, you are, you're known for so many things, but I think a lot of us know you and love you as being the, the chef of Rialto at the Charles Hotel in, in Cambridge. Tell us what that restaurant, that was your first restaurant, right? And you had it for 20 plus years? 22 years. It was the first restaurant where I was a chef and a partner mm. and ultimately the sole owner. It was, it was my life. It was a community. It was a world. And as it evolved over 22 years, my role evolved from being somebody who was exclusively in the kitchen to being in charge of the entire restaurant, as well as being a member of the community and feeling a responsibility in the community. So I really grew up there in terms of who I was professionally. I find even today people, it's four years since Rialto closed and I run into people who almost daily tell me how much they miss Rialto, miss being a part of that community, miss the experiences that they had there. So it was more than the food. It was, somebody once said they felt that Rialto was a hearth in the middle of Cambridge. I love that image. There was just this wonderful magnet as a gathering place for people. Well, and, and the bar was literally looked like a hearth. It was this gorgeous, what was it, travertine or something? It was yeah. lit. Onyx. Yeah. Oh. You know, Jody. so I, um, I'm i not from Boston. I, I've lived here for a while now, but I first came up to go to graduate school at the Kennedy School, which is for people not listening from Boston, which is most people, um, your restaurant is, is literally right next door to the Harvard um, Kennedy School. And there was this photo of you for Rialto and you were you were smiling and you had this very chic kind of short haircut and you just looked like a woman in charge who knew herself you were so glamorous it was this big photo of you in the middle of Harvard Square for your famous restaurant and I when I came to graduate school was feeling a bit lost as many people are and I looked at you because I would walk past you every day (laughs) (laughs) I thought oh man I want to be like it was just something about um, that anchor of your photo there, um, that really, to me, you really were like a physical woman leader in the community. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. That was hard for me. The photo? Well, the PR company said we need to put a big picture of you in front of the restaurant because Rialto is hard to find. It's not obvious. It was on the second floor. Mm. There wasn't a street entrance. There was hardly a sign. So we put that big photo of me and I, my kids, I was a little concerned that my kids would think that, you know, I was going over the top, but it, it was a way of saying to the world, this is the person in charge and this is the kind of experience you'll have. So, and, and the fact that, um, you knew that person in that picture, I love that. Um, and then you sort of had this period where you became like a TV celebrity chef, right? Um, which must've been totally surreal. But what is it like to emotionally sort of juggle all the balls of running a restaurant um, and then becoming a brand? I think we we all know that I think running a restaurant is very hard. The margins are bad. The hours are bad. It's very physically demanding. What was that evolution like for you when you sort of became famous? You were on Top Chef, Top Chef Masters, and you were a brand. What did it demand of you as a leader? It demanded respecting 
the role. I remember my first job as a chef was at Michaela's restaurant in Cambridge. And a sous chef and I were going off to do some event. And we pulled out of the garage and I had to open my car door to ha have the arm of the garage go up because the window in my car was broken. And he turned to me and he said, I can't be your sous chef unless you get a new car. Because <laughs> your car was too crappy. My car was too crappy. So, you know, I've, I learned that even, I didn't feel, you know, you don't, one does not necessarily feel like a celebrity chef. One feels like a really hardworking person who's juggling a million things and, and trying to be a good boss, a creative person, a good member of the community, and then also be a really good mom and a, and a good wife and a good daughter and a good sister. You know, there's so many things to juggle. So being a celebrity chef is not the first thing when I think about myself or ever thought about myself and also didn't really believe it. I had to pay attention to what it meant to, to have this, to be in this world, to be in an arena where I was a public figure and to respect that because it was important for the business. It was important for my professional life. And it was the people who allowed that to happen. And I learned that also from Julia Child, watching her operate in the world. She always had time for people. She always had time to be gracious and thank people. If she ever came to our restaurant, you know, people would go up to her, want autographs, and she was always there for people and knew that without them, she wouldn't have the presence that she had in the world. Hmm. Can you think, looking back, of the hardest moment you had as a business person and a manager in your time in restaurants? The most difficult period I went through, I thought, was opening Rialto for the second time, reinventing it in 2007, parting ways with my partners and working with architects and PR companies and writing a menu and hiring people and writing protocol. I did not have the experience and therefore didn't think I had the confidence to do it. I was super anxious. It was a great weight loss process, but <laughs> wasn't good for very much of anything else. I didn't face anything that hard again until I had to close Rialto. And I had chosen with my partners to open a restaurant, Porto, and also in the same year, a Saloniki. And I didn't know at the time that we were going through that, that I would be closing Rialto. So the combination of those things all happening at the same time was monumental. And later that year, my sister got really sick, and uh, from January through the middle of April, we watched as she declined, and ultimately she died. And I threw myself into taking care of Porto because Porto was struggling. And I came out by September. I was just a wreck. Like if you if you looked at me, I would cry. I just dragged myself around. My kids were calling to say, are you okay? You know, looking out for me, which was very unusual. And finally, Ken, my husband said, you know, you really need to see somebody. You need to go talk to somebody. I was like, no, I don't. I can do this by myself. I'm strong, blah, blah, blah. And I found a woman and actually she found me, went to see a, a therapist who's fabulous and wonderful. And I said to her, I don't want to talk about my parents. This is I, all I want is to find a way to manage these kinds of feelings because I know I've had them in the past and they will come back. And she said, this is grief and grief is a real thing. And I hadn't allowed myself to process the grief of closing Rialto a year before and then the loss of my sister. So and and the loss of my own identity as the owner of Rialto was huge. 
Why did you close Rialto? How did you come to that decision? So closing Rialto was a decision that I made. Uh, it was a difficult decision to make. It wasn't 100% what I wanted to do. It did make sense at the time, the owner of the hotel, and I agreed that it was time to part ways. Mm. But I wasn't, I wasn't 100% ready emotionally to do that. I didn't really know that until afterwards. But I hadn't finished what I wanted to do. I had intended to be there three more years. So psychologically, I still had three more years. Why? Why? Like, what was that 25 years that just felt good or? Yeah, it just felt good. My contract would have been up. Mm. You know, there, there were a variety of reasons to um, at that time. My daughter would have finished college. Mm. It would have been a, a new chapter in my life. And so I was preparing for that. And it just happened three years earlier than I had expected. I closed the doors. And I remember saying to Gordon Hammersley, who was um, is a good friend of mine and the first chef I really worked for, and I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to wear a chef's jacket again. I think that if I, when I cook, I'm not going to wear a chef's jacket. I just don't feel like I want to do that. I, j- I just felt so stripped of my identity as a chef. And he said, don't you dare. <laughs> you put that chef's jacket on. Get out back out there. And it took me a while to recalibrate, again, my who I was and my identity because my identity was so wrapped up in the community at Rialto who supported me. And to not be a part of that in the same way left a huge hole for me. Were you nervous about how you would communicate that to the community? Did you feel a sense that they might be confused or that you wouldn't, you, did you feel any shame about that? Like, I, I can imagine also, you know, being so public and being so beloved in a community and then it going away, people might have questions and that also could make, that would make me very anxious. Yes, very, very good point. I was nervous about telling people. I was really sad you can never be 100% honest about why in situations like that. And there was definitely shame. I felt like I, to a certain extent, I, I had failed, even though I knew that I hadn't. It felt that way. And I felt like I was failing the community and failing my family and, and, and failing as a professional. I want to talk about grief and, of course, your sister, but it it seems to me very relevant right now. A lot of us feel, I feel this way, you know, my small business um, before the pandemic was about to crest a wave. And I remember saying to my partner, we've finally done it. Like we were, we were, we had been working so hard and we were almost there in terms of, you know, new revenue goals and growth. And then it just all got taken away. It was this horrible, disruptive change. Um, Mm. um, Terrible. It's terrible. We're all feeling that now. Like, is there anything you can tell us about how to lead through that? Because you still had to show up and manage staff through this disruptive change that you wouldn't have chosen. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to pay attention to your strongest self and pay attention to what people around you are telling you as to who you are and what you represent in their lives because that hasn't gone away. Some stuff may go away. There may be stuff that you don't have anymore. I mean, we had to move. I lost a house, you know, and had to move and, and we're going to, we're all going to lose something in this, in this time. We're going to lose businesses. We're going to lose money. We're going to lose dreams. But that's just stuff. And some of it can be rebuilt. I mean, I don't mean to minimize the, the, how horrible this is and, and what the loss is going to be for many people. One thing that I found that was enormously helpful is, is a Buddhist practice, a meditation practice to pay attention to what's happening in the moment and look at the things that you actually can control right now. 
The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. When your sister was so sick, what did your days look like? Were you working more than ever? Were you working less? Well, How did she, you... So I'm in Boston and she was in New York. Hmm. And so my mother and my older sister and I were tag teaming <clears throat> down to New York to take care of her. She was at home the entire time. I'd go down for three or four days at a time and then come back and then go down and then come back. So when I was in New York with her, it was all consuming as a caretaker. The w one wonderful thing that I got to do was cook. <laughs> and <laughs> we had she, these wonderful meals where around her table there would be 10 or 12 people there they were just she was a magnet for people and so people would come and at the end of the afternoon and stay for dinner and those were the last sort of you know weeks of her life um, but it was really hard of course it's so hard to lose a sibling a best friend uh, watch somebody in their late 50s which is pretty young deteriorate particularly after she had been diagnosed, re-diagnosed four years before and at the time decided that she was going to live the best way she could and and rode her first pan mass challenge with stage four breast cancer and rode f four total. Hmm. She, had, she actually raised all of her money for her fifth ride, but she wasn't alive for her fifth ride. So she was an example and just a model of, of you know, how to live life day-to-day, moment-to-moment, when you don't know what's going to happen next and when there is so much loss. You said that um, grief was something that you hadn't allowed yourself to, I think you said, accept as real, something like that. Mm -hmm. Really? I mean, how? Like it, it, and, and you had never been in therapy before. Was that the fact? Uh, I, I had been in therapy before, not for years before. Mm not since, or years ago, I hadn't been in, in therapy for grief. Mm. And I knew that I was sad because my sister died. I knew that I missed her. But I didn't put all of the pieces together of closing Rialto and not really having a chance to process that because I was opening two other restaurants and then um, facing my sister's illness so the cumulative effect of that just took me to, down so very far that it was I was almost paralyzed. And this wonderful therapist who I found, I intentionally found somebody who has a meditation practice and that that's part of the therapy helped me with meditation work through the feeling of grief as being something very real and something to hold in my on my own terms what does that mean it means that it's you have to go into it and carry it and uh as somebody once said you know grief is like putting a bag of rocks on your back you don't necessarily doesn't get lighter you just get used to it and you get stronger mm. i don't ever feel that I won't be living with my sister's death and with her life. It will never be go away completely. She was way too important a person in my life. And um, in fact, <clears throat> right now, I'm getting a little teary, but right now in this crisis time that we're in, she would be somebody who would be so important for me to connect with. So I think about her a lot. And I think about the fact that if she were alive, she would be in New York right now figuring out how to help as many people as possible. 
So I think it, it's making, it's, ta- it's, it's, uh, it's not pushing grief away, not pushing the hard things away. It's actually um, a phrase that I came up with for myself was, you know, take suffering by the hand. I think it would be really helpful, actually, if you don't mind for listeners um, to talk through before your husband had an intervention with you, what your days with the grief felt like. Because, um, you know, I've had people in, in clinical depressions talk through what getting up when you're clinically depressed feels like. You know, it feels like you're carrying cement and even just walking to brush your teeth just feels like a lot. And um, can you think back to how your physical being felt in those days, your emotional being, your sleep? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, it was a combination of depression and anxiety. I was super anxious about the success of these new restaurants and at the same time, I was handling the grief of closing Rialto and my sister's uh, illness and ultimately death. Because I was anxious, I was able to get up and get going for a while. And then, then it was as though I was weighted and that nothing, I didn't care about anything. It was really hard to think about anything as being super important except getting through the day. And I was crying a lot. Um, a lot. If I would lie to, to go to sleep. I would lie on my back and just fold my hands over my uh, chest and either try and not count sheep, but some kind of mantra to make myself go to sleep. But But I also did find that medication was enormously helpful. So I went on an antidepressant, and then I also was on an anti-anxiety medication for a time when I needed it. It helped, you know, get me through that time, and then uh, as I, I came to a point where I felt more like myself, then I stopped the medication. Going to somebody to see a therapist who was able to say, everything that you're feeling is normal for what you've gone through it's not it doesn't mean that you're a weak person or that you're incompetent or you're not accomplished or you can't be successful or you haven't been successful in any of those things it just means that right now in this moment there was a you know avalanche of things that happened that brought you to this place Hmm. how long did it take till you started feeling a little bit more like yourself? I would say about six months. Mm. That's a long time. It was a long time. Did you keep working? Oh, yes. Yeah, working is good. Giving is good. One of the things that I did, because when my therapist said, you've lost your community, you need to find a new community. And I knew a woman named Sherry Hughes, is the, who's the chef at the Women's Lunch Place. Mm-hmm. It services women as a day shelter and serves breakfast and lunch and has showers and beds and laundry and um, toiletries. And I mean, it's an amazing, amazing place. Advocacy, they help the p- women find housing if that's something. They have a clinic there. So I decided that I wanted to volunteer there. It took me, it took me a couple of months to sort of get up my courage to go because I I felt so not myself and it was incredible what it did for me. It gave me a purpose every week I went there and uh, I had thought maybe I'd help with the laundry or something, but of course they put me in the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was just one more volunteer in a hairnet there, you know, an apron and gloves made my day. So, you know, I think giving is so important when you're feeling like you're just so turned into yourself, getting outside yourself and also connecting to the thing that's, that's really painful. And for me, it was, as I said, it was, I came up with this idea of what I was doing was taking suffering by the hand and just holding on to it. Um, 
and getting comfortable with it as opposed to trying to push it away. What advice would you give? I mean, you were you were the boss at some level, so you could take the space. I'm thinking of um, people who work hourly or who work really, really intensive schedules. What's your advice or how have you dealt with people in your restaurants who maybe have been through grief and have needed to take space but have felt like the kind of work they do doesn't allow them the space? I know that... In, in our businesses, we've when people are, have been going through difficult times and they let us know, then we give them the time. If it's um, somebody who wants to work, and often people want to work, then we just m- make sure that if they're comfortable with it, that everybody knows what they're going through and that there's a lot of love and support and a gentle hand with them. I mean, we just had somebody who works for us whose son died, um, not in this country, and in a really brutal way. And um, he was working the next day, and I asked him if he'd like to go home. And he said, no, I'm, this is a much better place for me to be. I'd much rather be here at work. I think everybody deals with things in different ways. I think creating a space where it's safe for people to tell you what's going on in their lives is extremely important. You know, we all we all face anxiety, stress, uncertainty. We all, you know, we feel like we're imposters, we're insecure, we're our our confidence plummets, you know, we all deal with that. Um What have you learned about being a caring leader who holds people, but also knowing when to let people fail on their own or learn on their own? Like, how do you balance it? Because you must, as both the person in charge whose name is on the door, but also a person who can't possibly manage everything, otherwise you'd go crazy, you must have to sort of triage situations a lot as a leader. Yes, and... You also have to hope that your investment in the, your leaders in the restaurant is, has paid off and that they're, they know what to do. I, I can't be in every situation, of course, and I also can't manage every situation and shouldn't manage every situation. What I can do is listen, ask questions, and let people know that we care about them and I care about them and we'll do everything in our power to make things right. But also each individual is responsible for um, advocating for themselves and dealing with conflict and managing a, you know, conflict themselves. Because if you don't manage your own conflict and you ask for help all the time, you don't evolve. My first concern right now in the situation that we're in with um, Corona is the staff. They're scattered now. There, 500 people work for us, and they're scattered all over the Boston area. And we don't have a lot of resources for them in this city. And I'm just hoping that I'm sending out emails about resources and hoping that it's helping but it's it's that's the hardest the hardest part about being a business owner is is always the people and the, it's the people because or it's the best part i guess it's both it's the best and the hardest yes right now it's really hard that's it for this week's show if you like what you've heard be sure to subscribe and submit a review in apple podcasts or wherever you get your shows And if you have an idea for the show or you want to tell us your story, drop me a note at anxiousachiever at gmail.com or you can tweet me at Mora A.M. That's M-O-R-R-A-A-M. Special thanks to the team at Harvard Business Review, my producer Mary Dew, the team at Podcast Garage, and all of our guests who are telling us their stories from the heart. From the HBR Presents Network, I'm Maura Ahrens-Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever.